Welcome back to the Cyber Underground. I know it's been a while, but we're here, we're back. We're talking about local tech support here in the islands. And you might think that uh, tech support, no big deal. You can get it anywhere, right? Well, no, the island community has its own flavor, its own community, its own sense of morals and justice and the way of doing things and its own lifestyle and its own timeline. So you got to get used to things. And the people that we depend on are right here in front of us. With us now is the CTO of Hawaii Tech Support. Timothy Ames. How you doing, brother? Hey, thanks for having Semper me. Fi. Yeah, Welcome Semper in, fi. man. Us, tell us what's going on in your world. How do you support our local community? What's new? What's not new? Yeah, what's so ongoing? yeah, there are some new things. Um, this year, uh, actually over the last two years, I think we've seen a lot of um, people moving to cloud technology. So, so basically what we do, we're a managed service provider. Um, we're the folks you would call if you're a small business and you want assistance. Um, you might not be able to afford a full IT staff or even a full-time IT person, but you still want to take advantage of those tools and technologies that are available um, in, the, in the IT world or in the, in the marketplace. Um, some of those tools can get pretty complicated to implement. The interdependencies between uh, the, the different tools are, are expensive to, to maintain. So we'll jump in there. Um, you can kind of you know, use us piecemeal or, or, or sign on for your know, continuous support. And we're like a fractional cost of uh, having a full-time person. So it, it, it's effective for small businesses, medium businesses, enterprise. That's what's old. That's what hasn't changed. I think what's changed uh, in the last uh, year or two is uh, security is becoming a real forefront in Huge. people's minds. Huge. Right. And uh, a lot more people in Hawaii are getting hit this year alone. Um, we're... This isn't the way we like to bring on new clients, right? <laughs> uh, but we are bringing on new clients this year because uh, they, they're getting hit with ransomware. They're getting $200,000 uh, ransoms uh, to restore. Right, their... one click away from the end of your world. <laughs> and right? it is, man, mm -hmm. it is. If you don't have a good backup uh, procedure in place, or you don't have some tools to just prevent this stuff, uh, I, honestly, th we've had companies that have been out of business for three weeks, you know, not able to, no income, no revenue, not able to pay people, not able to um, do uh, accounts payable. And well, it's not just to stop a business, but the fines that come afterwards. So if you get fined by the credit card people, if you, you know, someone takes away all your credit card numbers and an exfil and they take the data yeah. away, you get fined by the credit card vendors and the average loss is in the millions of dollars. You're a small business, you're out of business. You're out of business, yeah. That's it. And, and har hardly anybody's carrying cyber insurance. Uh, insurance yeah. is another thing. Yeah. If you've got insurance and you get breached, insurance rates go up. Right. Which could also drive you out of business. And, and they're going to say, hey, well, in some of those insurance writers come with, uh, well, were you, what were you doing to protect yourself? It's uh, like, due diligence. Yeah. yeah. Were you, were, it's, you know, you're not going to get a claim from your homeowner's insurance if you have a fire pit in the middle of your, you know, living room. You right. Know? And I didn't. Yeah. It was a horrible thing. Right. Right. I shouldn't have done it. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I think that's the biggest thing that we've been seeing um, is I, People have been at least more attentive because they're hearing their 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 neighbors or their friends, you know, their colleagues. Um, it's not just Home hit. Depot and Target anymore. This no, is like little yeah, vendors. It's, yeah, it's small businesses. Right. Small businesses have a lot of data. Everybody, everything we do is on on computers. Whether everything. that's your QuickBooks accounting, you know, if it's your uh, you know your homegrown application that just keeps track of your your vendors and your uh, clients. Your you know. Excel spreadsheet. Your Excel spreadsheet. With all your yeah, passwords. And, got, yeah. <laughs> and what we've been seeing too is the people that are getting hit. Um, when we go there and we start doing forensic investigation, and we start to look at okay, what was the what was the framework of the attack? What what did the attack look like from start to finish? What we're finding is that generally the attacks start a few months before that ransomware hits. You're doing open source intelligence at that point. You're you're. You're preparing to do the attack. They're not only preparing right. to do the attack, but what they're doing is they're gathering all the financial data that they can. They're, they're in the network, and they're just gathering stuff. You know, we, we don't know what they're gathering at that point because, you know, they, they destroy the evidence. They, they destroy the chain of evidence, you know. Oh, but, it sounds like Equifax. There were two breaches. Mm -hmm. The first one they didn't report because no data was taken. Right. But that was the time between the first and the second data breach they were looking around. They were doing reconnaissance. Yeah. Yeah, they were gathering the information, and then, and, and then when they're ready to exfiltrate, they exfiltrate, and then Only what's they important. throw a grenade back in, you know, behind them, and <laughs> bam, there, there goes yeah, all the no data. No evidence. Right, yeah, no right. evidence. Wow, so the ransomware is a huge one now, and uh, backups, like you're saying, are immensely important, and a backup rotation policy 
as well. So you don't have your backups all in one place. Yeah. A lot of people think because they have a backup um, USB connected external hard drive mm -hmm. that that's a good enough backup. Right. But as you know, ransomware, once yeah. it takes effect, goes where? It goes to every drive that's attached. Including your backup drive. Yeah, and, and some are even targeting, so Windows, uh, you know, most, organiza most corporate organizations are running some kind of Windows uh, server or, or desktop. And some of the ransomware specifically attacks the built-in, like, shadow copy that Windows holds. So, you know, by default, if you delete, or not by default, but if you have shadow copy on, this, it's a little protection. If you accidentally delete a file, you can, not, not in the recycle bin, but if you accidentally change a file, you can go back to previous versions. Well, ransomware is getting smart. It's attacking that now. You know, it's, uh, it's attacking backup solutions now. So the only real way to, is to have a good backup is to have some kind of enterprise-grade backup solution where it's backing up locally and hopefully backing up off-site, um, probably somewhere in the cloud, inside of an isolated data center that you can recover from. And you guys offer this? We offer this, yeah. yeah we, this we, is, one of, this is one, of our, one of our services, and it's a big seller for you know, the folks that do get hit. Um, this is one of the big sellers that, you know, it was our big recommendation. Yeah, you want to have a firewall. You want to have uh, your antivirus in place. Um, but, you know, once that stuff fails, <laughs> you got to be able to recover the data. Because no one's immune from a zero day. Right. right? Nobody's Those... immune from an attack that hasn't been registered in, inside of uh, some database somewhere that, you know, is given a signature for your antivirus to recognize it. Um, but and there are advanced websites where you can buy zero days. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're, they're very valuable um, because there's no defense against them. Uh, you know, it, it's not even zero days that, that are really the bigger problem either. It's just people not patching their systems. That's a huge problem, yeah, right? So, so that's another, uh, how a managed service provider can support um, clients in customers is that we'll take over your patch management policy, you know, so that's something's very overlooked, but um, I don't know if you remember, like, well, I know you remember, but I don't know if some of your viewers remember a couple of years ago, the NSA had some tools that were leaked. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we, <laughs> yeah. Verizon is still out there. <laughs> right, and it's still out there. Yeah. And the funny thing is, um, you know, pretty much the entire industry, Microsoft, got together, they were even releasing patches for operating systems they didn't support anymore. Oh, so that they did that, Microsoft did that for the Windows 7 in uh, the... In the Windows XP, yeah, or yeah. And Windows XP yeah. for WannaCry. Right, for right. the WannaCry yeah, virus, right? Yeah. So they were saying, this is so important, we're going to release a patch for an operating system that we technically don't even support anymore, just to get, it, you know, just, just download it and apply it. People didn't apply it. And so there was a lot more... It had a much bigger footprint than it should have. Um, right. So we take over the patching. You know, any managed service provider is going to do very similar stuff. We do it better now. We, no. <laughs> yeah. I believe you plus you're local and you're here. We are local and, here. And people yeah. um, in Hawaii tend to trust people that are here. Yeah, it, I, I get out because you want to reach out and touch someone. And, and I get that. Um, I, I get that. You know, yeah. I understand that. And, you know, it's, it's good to have somebody to just be able to drive over and, and work with you. And a lot and of virtual only goes so far. It does. Yeah. It can do 90%. It can do maybe 80, 80, 80 90%, and it's that extra 10%. Right. And that's yeah. what we look for here in the islands, that, that, that special touch. You know, right. if you can go half a beer with somebody at Murphy's. Yeah, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and it means a lot to us instead of, you know, contracting with a mainland company where, you know, companies might just be a number, yeah. and a huge block of numbers. So if I went out and said, sorry, I'm going to back on RSA for a minute, but this huge company, right? I go mm -hmm. out to Semantic or, hey, hey, I need this kind of service from them. I'm just one of a million customers. Sure. But out here, I'm, I'm a lot more special because you guys are highly focused. Yeah, and you deal with the local community. Yeah. And you, when you're working with a um, local company too, I think it helps because you can build that relationship. You, you, we're, every, every company in, in Hawaii is interconnected in some way. We all know, you <laughs> know, all we, we all, yeah, we're all cousins <laughs> in some way. Uh, you know, and so we're interconnected. We build relationships. We understand the business um, that you're in, you know, that our customers are in. Um, we may not, we may not understand, you know, we're not their operations officers, but we understand their business enough to become their CIOs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, their, their information officers, their technology officers. So we can fill that gap for them because we understand their business. We understand their business environment a little better than, um, yeah, some remote folks would, where you're just a number would be able to do. You said something really important in the beginning when you, when you first introduced your business model for your company is as businesses grow, they adopt new technologies. But sometimes the older ones don't go away. Yeah. So the interconnection of those two, the little mashups that you mm -hmm. have to do, that becomes an important part of your, your regimen. 
what you right. offer because they can't get rid of some of their legacy system. Yeah. They can't just keep converting and converting every year. They've got to keep adding new stuff for new services, but keep their old data around. So you have to support all that. We do. And I'll tell you, though, for a lot of the legacy systems, we'll say, you know, if, if it's very apparent that this is just a non-starter for the business, they're going to keep it and they're not going to get off of it ever. You know, we'll, we'll take that and we'll drive on with it because at the end of the day, we're supporting that business. But we'll also be the biggest champion for, you know, for getting off the legacy systems and trying to get to more um, robust systems. But we'll, we're not just going to say, hey, you got to do this. We're going to present different courses of action. And hopefully we can, you know, convince, uh, you know, the lines of business that this is the way to go to. Well, at some to, point it becomes yeah. not only essential, but... Um, a, a managed risk. It's and, a risk, and it's yeah. affordable, right. right? So you just keep giving them options until it's something that they say, "Yeah, we can do this now." Exactly. Uh, yeah, you might not be able to do it up front. Sure, but you can move on. Another thing you talked about was patch management. I don't think a lot of people understand out there that it's not just about your Windows system mm -hmm. or your server or your desktop. It's about your mobile devices. Yeah, it's about your IoT devices, your yep. routers, your switches, your hubs, whatever you've got out there that's got firmware. Yeah. Uh, your Apple TV. Right. Yeah, you need uh, an upgrade. Uh, the Apple Watch. You got to come out with a, <laughs> yeah. you know, every time. And then, oh, I hate this. You got to buy a new Apple Watch because the new OS don't, doesn't yeah. work anymore. And yeah. now, you know, your device is not secure. You know, some of the, um, yeah, some of the bigger overlooked devices on the network that have been used uh, to what's called pivot and attack from have been uh, voice over IP phones. Uh, well, that's a big one because the VoIP yeah. system might be connected to the actual network. Nine times out of ten yeah. it is, yeah. So you, you take over the voice over IP server and you use that as a pivot point to right. attack the rest of the network. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a big one. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you do to overcome this? Do you, do you isolate that usually or do you suggest that? Yeah, so um, and that, that's the difference between you know, going in. A, a lot of this technology can just be plugged into whatever router or switch that Surpack or Spectrum or Hawaii Telecom provides, you know, right. you plug it in, it works, you're like, sweet, it works. Um, that doesn't bring in any kind of security posture, though. So what we do is we start to bring in managed switches and routers and firewalls that actually segment the networks into different logical networks so that the people, if there is ever an attack on your phone because the patches were behind or whatever, um, that the traffic to, you can't traverse into the production network, you know, the workstations, the servers, and the servers. So that's one way of doing it. Network segmentation yeah. takes a lot of work for someone who's an amateur and for someone who, it's not their daily business. Yeah. Right? right. So it's, it's important to bring in the expert who charges a reasonable price to get it done so that person can go off and sell tires. Yes. Run their farm, uh, yeah. open their 7 Eleven or ABC store, right? That's important. And I think. A lot of people try to do it all. They do try and yeah. do it all, and what I see is it becomes um, there's like a fatigue that happens when it start when you start to get into um, like if I started to try and you know become an auto mechanic, I would I would be lost on the first day. Yeah, I could probably <laughs> struggle by and I can get stuff done. I'd look you know open up the manuals and you know maybe be able to get my way through it very slowly and probably very inaccurately, um, but. When people take on that kind of responsibility on them, themselves, yeah. and their business grows, and it just gets out of hand, and now that it's out of hand, and it may may not have had a solid foundation, um, but you kept building on top of it, it, it just it's more work to to redo. And uh, that's when the big risk where, comes. Yeah, in. that's when the big risk comes in because now you have a weak foundation. Everything's built on top of it. We're going to take a short break. We're going to pay some bills. We'll come right back. Everybody, come right back in one minute after these commercials. Until then, stay safe. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to join us on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock for Cannabis Chronicles, the 10,000 year odyssey, where we take a look at cannabis as food, cannabis as medicine, cannabis and religion, and cannabis and dear old Uncle Sam. So please join us to learn all about cannabis. Again, Wednesdays at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm your host, Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World. I'm, I come to you live every second Friday from 3 p.m. And this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health, 
and uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier and have fun at the same time. So do join me. I look forward to seeing you and uh, aloha. Welcome back, hope you missed us. We're back now to talk with Timothy Ames, CTO of Hawaii Tech Support, about local tech support options here in the islands. And one of the things we're gonna cover right now, very important, virtualizing things like MS Office. Everybody uses Microsoft Office. We use Word, Excel, lots of us use PowerPoint. I'd help us all, because I could die at a PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's become enormously expensive to get the old CDs and install it everybody on all their workstations right. and license every copy and keep that in a little folder in your desk and then patch everybody's workstation individually. But now Microsoft has come out with Office 365. Yeah, so it's a subscription-based service which a lot of IT um, software is going towards, whether it's Adobe, Microsoft. Um, the reason why they want to go subscription-based is because I guess it's just a continuous stream of revenue. But it also makes sense for the customer because you're paying a small monthly subscription rather than a big outlay every three or five years. This has to do with scale. So a yeah. lot of companies ramp up during the holidays, for instance, and then ramp back down after the holidays. And if that happens, they can scale their business with this subscription. Sure. And then the very next month, scale it on back. Yeah. Um, one of the bigger things with Office 365, too, is, yeah, it gives you your desktop apps. Um, you don't necessarily, ha you know, your Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all that access. Um, you don't have to have those office, those office products, though, because everybody, I think one of the biggest uh, uh, force multipliers for a business is email communication. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you may have a user that needs, uh, or, you know, one of your staff that needs email, but doesn't necessarily need the office products. Business essentials. Yeah, for business essentials. essentials. Right, right. Um, and if... You know, even for your frontline workers, there's something cheaper than Business Essential, which is the F1 for frontline workers, where all they need is email. It's not, never going to be very much email. You just need to be able to email them every day, you know, a schedule or something like that. Very inexpensive. You're talking like $4 a month um, per Yeah, and even the email. Business Essentials, I think, is only 5 bucks a month. Yeah, it's not that much. Yeah, they're, 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 they're all dirt with cheap. Teams, yeah. right? Which is the old Skype. They made Teams now. You teams do is... And things. Teams is very robust. Teams can be your phone system now. And that's not something a lot of people don't know about uh, Office 365, is it is a voice over IP system as well. Um, we've been replacing uh, phones for customers that are on PBX system, you know, old style telephone switches in their office, huge to maintain. Again, we gotta worry about security patching, all that kind of stuff. It's tied into the network, it needs to be patched. Um, the voice over IP phones are coming straight from Microsoft. And they're just add-ons to, if you already have an Office 365 uh, enterprise account, well, it's just an add-on to, to get a phone service. It could tie right into Teams. You get a headset. You don't have to have a desk phone. You can have a desk phone, but I think a lot of people are adopting just having a headset um, or a Bluetooth earpiece connected to their computer. There you go. You got your phone system. And it comes with just an enormous amount of benefits, including... Yeah. Uh, the more you scale up that subscription service to Office 365, the more security features you get. You do, yeah. So it starts, um, you have the business line, which is the uh, business essentials, business premium. Then you have the enterprise line, so the E1. E1 is like the enterprise one. It comes with all of the online versions of Office. Um, three comes with the online and offline versions of Office, and it adds things like uh, email encryption. Uh, you can also add all that stuff a la carte, so it makes uh, it's very cost effective for companies that you know they might not need everything that's in the E5, which is their flagship you know subscription, which comes with advanced threat protection for email. Um, it comes with anti phishing. Uh, it comes with all that you know encryption. It comes with just tons of stuff. Now that's why I call you as a small business. Yeah. Like I, this is my outlay. This is what I need. Tell me what subscription I should be going right. to and how you can effectively you know, get me up to that point without breaking my bank. And yeah. what people, I don't think people understand how cost effective this is. Uh, the price for an enterprise three level, mm -hmm. it's only 20 bucks a month per user. Yeah, 20 I mean, bucks includes a lot of that's stuff. That's tons, yeah. that's yeah. tons of things. And the E5 is just over the top. Right. Right? So the E3 can replace things like uh, WebEx, you know, Cisco WebEx or the or GoToMeeting Zoom. or Zoom. Right. It can replace that because you have the Teams. A, team, a Teams call can support up to 250 users so at the same time. At the same time, yeah. <laughs> out of the box. Right. You know, so that's amazing. Um, 
Also, you know, a lot of people are worried about moving to Office 365. They're worried about the cost to get their email over there. And um, so I got to tell everybody now that it's very, we have it down as far as like migrating from, you know, Gmail or from, you know, an old exchange server that's on-prem and, you know, rotting away, getting ready to collapse on you. That's the kind of stuff that we do. That's the, uh, one of the backbones, the cores of our um, mission is to do migrations up to Office 365. Um, so now just with the people at Cheap Seats, you're talking yeah. about, I have uh, Gmail, I've been using it for 10 years, and yeah. I want to go from the G Suite stuff to Office 365, and I'm worried. I got a lot of email, I don't want to lose that. Not just your email. So people aren't really worried about the email. They're pretty confident that we can get that over. What they're usually worried about is their calendars, their contacts, oh, yeah. their notes. <laughs> you know, the people, the companies live and die by some of those shared sure, calendars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is like... That's the orchestrator of everything. I live and die by mine. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, to re be at ease, everybody, you know, rest assured that all that comes over and there's there's no problems with it. But there's certain steps you take, a yeah. little bit at a time, and then you do a cutover. Right. And at yeah. the cutover, everything's already migrated, yeah. and everyone knows, and you inform them. And this takes several yeah. weeks, and everyone's, you don't panic anybody. Sure. Uh, like the old days. Oh yeah, but Monday when you come back in, everything will be right. Yeah. Uh, it never yeah. was. Yeah. <laughs> And it's the thing is, know, yeah, though. people on Gmail, they're like most people on other email services are already using Outlook on their desktop. You know, a lot sure. of people they Take don't use the email. web version; they use you know the Outlook. And a lot of customers won't even notice that you know on the back end anything's changed. All the calendar states because you moved the domain over. Right. So really, the client only thinks you're changing the password. Yeah, right. They it's might have to. Email. Yeah, they'll come in and they'll have to log in. You know, they'll get a prompt to change. You know, can you re-enter your password? And that'll be it. Let's talk about email for a minute. Uh, we were talking before the show about some email features you can set up for security yes. to do anti-spam and anti-phishing. Yeah. So um, there's a couple features uh, called uh, SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. I won't go into the acronyms, but if we have a slide, can you pull up the first slide? Um, so the one on the left is the SPF. What is it? The middle is the DKIM and then the DMARC. So basically what it is, is um, there are ways of identifying who you are when you're sending an email. Um, can you go to the next slide? Oh, can you zoom out on that? Let's see. We can't get yeah. the whole slide on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what you're doing is in the, in the envelope, all the, all the pieces of the email, when you send it a little yeah. package, there are certain fields in there that you yeah. need to match to verify that who right. is sending the email is actually, it's actually from that domain, it's or from that user, it's from that yes. authorized server. Yeah, so, so SPF and DKIM will look at, to see where the email is coming from. If it's coming from the IP address of a server that you own. Okay, so if it has your domain name attached to it, like, you know, davidstevens.com, and it's not coming from the davidstevens.com server, then the receiving server will likely reject it. Not only that, where DMARC comes into play is, your DMARC will tell you from other servers. Other servers will report to you, hey, I'm getting emails from not you. And these are where they're coming from. So you can do some investigation and say, oh, it's a spam server or whatever. So you're protecting not only your servers. So you're protecting your servers from emails coming in not that don't have you know, these signatures coming from appropriate. You know. What happens now is people get phishing emails <laughs> from their own CEO. Okay. Right, right. It looks like it's coming from their CEO. The CEO is emailing the CFO or the finance, the accounting guy. We need this bank transfer. We need this right done. Right yeah, we need it done now. Don't have time to talk about it. Just do it. All right. And you look at the email. It looks like it's coming from the CEO. It's a business email compromise. DKIM and SPF prevent that from happening. So that now, only, DKIM's interesting, right? Yeah. DKIM uses a public private key. Domain key. Yeah. Right. So it's a domain key versus. Um, so that's the DK. And there's do domain key identify mail. And uh, yeah, so it uses public private keys and it, it won't be spoofed. So you can be rest assured. Now, the DMARC, though, protects, you're not only protecting your own organization, but you're protecting the reputation of your organization to other people. So that if an email supposedly gets sent from you to a vendor saying, hey, for accounts, pay, you know, for your payment on your account this month, Send it to this bank account. We changed our you know, accounts receivables. Send it to this account instead of this account. Thanks. So if you have DMARC set up, you'll never see that email. Though your vendor will never see that email. If you've got your spam settings set yeah. up right. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, it take, and, that, and that's where it comes in, where it's better to hire somebody to go through right. it, even if it's just a one term, you know, one time engagement. You know, make sure it's set up correctly at the beginning because yeah, it's, that's it's when it matters the most. It's a little scary. I think there's a couple settings you can you can set this up for uh, nothing, so you can monitor your own stuff. You can set it to quarantine mm -hmm. or spam it, or you could just simply reject it. Right. Which is you'll never see it. Yeah. Right? It'll just get sent back to you. I don't know. What's your recommendation? Would you spam it so you can at least see these things coming in? If you don't have anybody monitoring it, I would just say reject it. Yeah. If you have somebody monitoring and you actually want to track that type of behavior. Um, to see if there's any kind of trends, you know, it, it can get, it can be valid information to see like good forensic data. Yeah, good forensic data um, to identify if there's any attack trends. Like uh, we're over a series, you know, a series of time that you'll see more attacks versus less attacks. But if you don't have a full time security team and you just don't want to confuse the system, just reject, just it. reject it. Don't give people a chance to to pull it out of quarantine. And I think we it. fixed the slide. We put it back up here. And there it is. Okay, yeah, so that's an example. Um, people sending from not uh, a non-allowed domain are just blocked. And, uh, you know, that, that's kind of, look, you can either reject it, send it to the, to the junk folder, or you can just reject it completely and, and don't even allow people to see it. Um, but that's a basic idea. And then the next slide, if it comes up the right size, there, there we you go. go. <laughs> so, so that's an example of an effective, you know, how it looks coming from your mail server versus other mail servers. And why it's important is that those third-party newsletter service provider gets an SPF failure going to your partner. So that protects your reputation or your customer, you know, because if somebody's using your email address to fish one of your customers, you know, it's important that you're protecting them as well. So would you recommend, uh, you know, you could set these, uh, I think the DMARC and the DKIM, you can both uh, say that it's okay for MailChimp to send on our behalf. You have to set that yeah. up, yeah. So if you're using any kind of uh, mail platform or, um, yeah, so MailChimp is a good example, SurveyMonkey, you know, any of these uh, third-party services that you're using, yeah, you do have to set them up. So if you don't keep that in mind, you know, if you don't know all your dependencies, you'll break your own. Uh, tools again, but it, go to the expert. Go to the expert. Go to yeah. the expert because you're really, going to ask. Really easy to fix. Do yeah. you do Mailchimp? Do you do yeah. SurveyMonkey? And if they right. say yes, okay, well, we need to add these settings That's here. Right. And uh, you know, your ears are so magnificent. You sit down and you listen to a customer, and through the words that they say, you're picking out the keywords and the services that you can help them with. Yeah, and we do a lot of discovery too. You know, we'll, we'll pick up a keyword, we'll say, whoa, 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 hold on, can we go back to that for a second? We'll, we'll, we'll go Let's down a whole other that. path. Yeah. Let's dig down. Right. You also offer something that I think is extraordinarily valuable, and we don't have a whole lot of it here in the islands, especially for small and medium business, incident response. That's something where you go in and you forensically examine a company during an incident of some kind, ransomware or email phishing or whatever, but that kind of team has to be ready to go yeah, and on the job in you know, a couple of hours. And not a lot of people can have those kind of resources sitting around, yet you do. Yeah, and we, we're able, you know, th through our own local staff, plus our partnership with a, um, um, a security operations center in uh, the mainland U.S. Um, I say U.S., I call out specifically, everybody knows what mainland is, but I call it specifically because we deal, we, financial, yeah. we, we deal with financial, we deal with financial organizations and we deal with um, government organizations where that type of operation has to be managed from within the U.S., mm. um, so within U.S. borders. Contiguous U.S. Yeah. yeah. Um, so because uh, we use U.S. partners, we're also able to work with financial organizations. But yeah, we, we have an incident response uh, team, incident response plan. Where you know this is worst case scenario happens, backups are gone, or even you know even if you have the backups, you want to figure out, hey, how did that attacker get in? So can what did they again. have access yeah. to while they were in? What did they do while they were in there? And uh, it's really important to call somebody in the beginning, um, and then we'll go through the same steps that you would go through. You know, notify the FBI. Can they do anything? I don't know, but it's good for them to have these numbers. It's good for them to have uh, input. Um, and samples of the malware. Samples of the malware. Yeah. Um, and if there's any Bitcoin uh, wallets attached to, like, if it's a uh, ransomware, um, they can track that, you know. And, and there's been a lot of uh, cases where, you know, people have gotten caught just by, you know, the bad guys have gotten caught via Interpol, via You're the You're not FBI. anonymous on Bitcoin. You're not. It, it, yeah, it's, it's a it's, number. Yeah, they it's can a number. It. And you see the transfers going back and it's forth. A bank. Yeah. <laughs> You're more anonymous, but, you you know, it's harder, more difficult to track, but it's it's... All those transactions are public, so. In our last couple of seconds, yeah. 
Give us a promo for Hawaii Tech Support. All right. Tell us what's, what, what you're about and why we should call you. You know, we're focused on simplifying IT. At, at the core, that's what we are. We simplify IT so you can focus on your business. And I think that's, that w that's, what, makes us, uh, that's what makes us a partner. You that's know? an essential service. Yeah, it's an essential so service. Take over IT so I can do my business. And, and simplify it. You know, make it simple. That's great. Yeah. Okay, thanks for being yeah, thanks, here. Yeah, Thank you very much. Yeah. That was Timothy Ames from Hawaii Tech Support. Thanks for joining us here. Uh, for local tech support on uh, the Cyber Underground, we will be back in about two weeks with another topic that's going to interest you and please you. And, and I'll bring my clever and pithy uh, dialogue with <laughs> maybe a great guest as well. Until then, everybody, stay safe.